The Basics of Biblical Greek Chapter 30 We have been working with participles for a period of time now. Let's do a bit of review of the key forms to remember and how to distinguish adverbial and adjectival participles. In general, participles are formed starting with a verb, an unaugmented tense stem to be precise, adding a participle morpheme, which provides the mood and voice, and finishing with a case ending. Connecting vowels often intervene. The present active participle is formed by taking the present stem plus a connecting vowel plus the participle morpheme nu tau and the 313 case endings. To identify these forms, it's a good idea to memorize these six endings on, usa, on, ontos, uses, ontos. The present middle passive participle is formed by taking a present stem, a connecting vowel, the participle morpheme mena or mene, and the 212 case endings. In this particular circumstance, memorizing amanas e on should provide enough of, of a cue to identify these forms. The first aorist active participle is formed with an unaugmented aorist active stem, a tense formative, sigma alpha, a participle morpheme, nu tau, and the 313 case endings. To help identify these forms, memorize sas, sasa, san, santos, sases, santos. The first aorist middle participle is formed similarly, an unaugmented aorist active stem, the tense formative sigma alpha, but the participle morpheme is different, mena or mene, as are the case endings coming from the 212 pattern. To recognize these forms, memorize samanos, samane, samanon. The first aorist passive participle is formed with the unaugmented aorist passive stem from the sixth principal part, a tense formative, theta epsilon, the participle morpheme, nu tau, and the 313 case ending system. To identify these forms, memorize thes, thesa, then, Thentos, theses, thentos. We don't review the second aorists here because the second aorist active is identical to the present active except for the use of the aorist stem. Similarly with the second aorist middle. The second aorist passive uh, is formed like the first aorist passive. The only difference is the tense formative is epsilon, not theta epsilon. Knowing how to recognize the form of the participle is only half of the work. The next step is to focus on the function, asking the question as to whether the participle is adjectival or adverbial. In this particular case, the presence or lack of an article is key. Adverbial participles never have an article. Adjectival par participles are usually articular. The context helps when there is ambiguity. Let's look at a chart to work our way through this identification process. Greek presents the reader with a participle. The first question to ask is, is an article present? If the answer is yes, the participle is adjectival. 
If the answer is no, the participle is adverbial, usually, and one can then uh, translate it in any number of circumstantial ways. As to an adjectival participle, the next question to ask is, is a noun present? If the answer is yes, the participle functions as an attributive, saying something about the noun. If the answer is no, then uh, the participle is functioning substantively. It stands in for a noun. With this review in place, we turn now to chapter 30. We'll start by looking at the form of the first perfect participle, both active and middle passive. We'll talk a bit about how to translate the perfect participle. Then we'll take up a new usage. It's an adverbial usage of the participle called the genitive absolute. And to that we'll add a discussion of another adverbial usage, namely that of a paraphrastic construction. On to the forms of the first perfect participle. The components of the perfect active participle are, first of all, reduplication, either consonantal or vocalic, the perfect tense stem, which is derived from the fourth principal part, a tense formative, kappa, a participle morpheme, omicron tau for the masculine and neuter, or upsilon sigma for the feminine, and the 3-1-3 case ending system. The nominative singular masculine is lelicos. Notice the various parts, the uh, reduplication, the stem, the tense formative, the um, participle morpheme, and the case ending. In this particular example, when the sigma of the case ending is added to the participle morpheme, omicron tau, the tau drops out. And to compensate for its loss, the omicron lengthens to omega. Doing so also helps to distinguish it from the neuter. In the nominative singular feminine, Following the tense formative kappa, the um, participle morpheme for the feminine, upsilon sigma, is added, and it's followed by the ending consonantal yoda alpha. The appearance of the two consonants with the sig or of the two vowels with the sigma in between causes the sigma to drop out. And the dropping out of that sigma causes the consonantal yoda uh, to convert to a vocalic yoda, thus the ending quia. In the nominative singular neuter, the ending is cos. The case ending actually is a sigma here. Um, the it causes the tau to drop out, but with the neuter there's no compensatory lengthening. Thus, cos of the, of the nominative singular masculine is distinguished from cos of the nominative singular neuter. In the genitive singulars, one can more clearly see all of the parts and the 3-1-3 case endings. Please note that in the perfect active participle, the accent is not recessive into the stem. The yodas 
of the case ending are visible across the dative singular. In the accusative singular feminine, lalequion, again, the accent is not recess recessive into the stem. Because the ultima alpha is short and it is preceded by a diphthong, the diphthong acquires a circumflex accent. The same thing occurs in the nominative plural feminine, lelequii. In the genitive plural feminine, the noun type accent occurs, and so the form is lelequion. In the dative plurals of the masculine and neuter, the tau drops out before the sigma iota ending, as in the nominative. But unlike the nominative masculine, the, uh, the vowel of the participle morpheme does not lengthen. The accusative plurals close out the paradigm. Again, for identification's sake, it is not necessary to memorize the entire paradigm. Familiarity with the first two lines, cos quia cos, cotos quias, cotos, is sufficient. The components of the perfect middle passive participle are as presented here. Reduplication, the perfect tense stem, this time drawn from the fifth principal part, the perfect middle. There is no tense formative, just the participle morphine, mena, mene, and the two, one, two case endings. In the nominative singulars, lelimenos, lelimene, lelimenon, please note that in the masculine and neuter the accent is not recessive into the stem, as one might expect. In the genitive singular, the endings flow similarly to other examples we've had of menos, mene, menon, menu, menes, menu. And indeed, the rest of the paradigm is so regular that there is no necessity to discuss subcomponents of it. Memorizing menos, mene, menon is sufficient to identify these forms. Let's work next on translating the perfect participle. Generally, the perfect participle is translated with the helping word having. If the participle is adverbial in form, the additional help after is generally used. Consider the first example. Makarioi hoi dediogmenoi henneken dikaiosines. Notice the perfect participle, dediogmenoi, is um, adjectival and, in fact, substantival, the presence of the article. So, one would translate it, blessed are the ones having been persecuted on account of righteousness. The second example reads, heron ton paideon beblemenon epitain clinane kai ta daimonion Exhalely thos, namely, she found the child having been placed on the bed and the demon having left him. Next we leave the perfect participle per se and move on to a broader topic called the genitive absolute. The genitive absolute is recognized by the appearance of a genitive, noun, pronoun, or noun complex, and a genitive participle with which it agrees in case, gender, and number. 
And these two genitive forms have no grammatical relationship to the rest of the sentence. They're not genitive because they're following a preposition, for example. This construction, the genitive absolute, is a circumstantial or adverbial construction that's usually temporal. And it solves the problem that, that we have of describing the circumstances under which the main action takes place in a way where that circumstance is not done by the actors of the main action. Previously, if the subject of the main action was doing it, the circumstantial participle was in the nominative case. If the direct object, it was in the accusative case. If the indirect object, it was in the dative case. However, what if the main action does happens under a circumstance that doesn't involve anybody in the main action. For example, while the child was running across the street, the mother screamed for help. The main clause is the mother screamed for help. Under what circumstances? Because the child was running across the street. But the child is not part of the main clause. This is an example where a genitive absolute would be used in Greek. Upon meeting a genitive absolute, the first thing to do in translation is to forget that the words are genitive. And don't try to translate them as genitives. Don't use the helping word of or anything like that. Instead, make the genitive noun the subject of the participial action Stress the aspect of the, of the participle. Most genitive absolutes are temporal, so use while with the present tense or after with the aorist tense. And use a finite form of the participle's lemma. In other words, translate the participle as if it were an indicative. Consider our first example. Tauta autu la luntos autois, idu archon pros erketai auto. Notice that the autu and the la luntos are both genitive. We have a genitive pronoun and a genitive uh, participle. That's the warning sign, genitive absolute. And they are not genitive because of something else that happens in the main clause. The main clause here is highlighted in green. In fact, they're separated from the main clause by a comma. So this is an example of where a genitive absolute uh, translation would be used. We change the out to from the genitive into a subject, he, and we make the participle into an indicative verb, is saying, and we stress its aspect, its present participle, with the use of while. So, while he is saying these things to them, that's the circumstance under which the main verbal action takes place, behold, a ruler comes to him. The second example is similar, only an aorist participle is used. Notice the outu in the genitive and a Pontes in the genitive. The outu is translated as the subject of the participial action. And because the participle is aorist, the helping word after is used. And after he said this, a dispute, stasis, happened or arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. For our last topic, we take a look at periphrastic constructions. We handle them at this point in Greek because quite a few are formed using a perfect participle. In English, we are quite accustomed to use a helping word and a gerund, an ing word, to equal a main verb. So, for example, I am running, and the helping word running the gerund means about the same thing as I run. The same thing occurs in Greek with a participle. A form of a me, the helping word, plus the participle functions like an indicative verb. 
So the phrase legon a me, the participle legon, the uh, form of a me, equals or is identical to lego. Both phrases would be translated I speak or I am speaking. This paraphrastic construction, as it's called, the appearance of a participle plus the form of a me, occurs primarily with the present and perfect participles. Um, and it's just an alternate way of doing the indicative. So if one wants to write in the present tense, one could use the present of a me plus a present participle. If one wants to communicate something using the imperfect tense, an alternative would be the imperfect of a me plus the present participle. Similarly for the future, an alternative, the future of a me plus the present participle. Uh, one can communicate the perfect tense with the perfect indicative or the present of a me plus a perfect participle. This is the one that occurs most often. The pluperfect is communicated by the imperfect of a me plus the perfect participle. And the future perfect can be communicated by the future of a me plus a perfect participle. Again, these are just alternate ways of doing what can be done with an indicative verb. Uh, why use the alternate? Uh, stylistic, purely. There's no difference in meaning. Let's look at some examples. Uk estin gegramenon ento nomo. Notice a participle, gegramenon, plus a form of a me. In this case, it's estin. Present of a me plus the perfect participle is translated like a perfect indicative. The question of Jesus, is it not written or has it not been written in the Torah? Our second example reads, Ein apalolos kai herethe. Notice it's the imperfect of me, of Amy. He had been lost, but was found in the parable of the prodigal son. Our third example again uses the imperfect, asan, plus two perfect participles. They had been harassed and helpless, like sheep not having a shepherd. And the future perfect is illustrated by our fourth example. Notice the esti plus the perfect passive participle. Whatever you loose on earth, will have been loosed in the heavens. Very important, I would argue, theologically, that this construction is used here uh, in the um, Office of the Keys. It's not that sins will be, but they have already been, and the impact continues. So in this lesson, we've looked at the form of the first perfect participle. We have looked at the translation of that participle, and we've added two new syntactical structures, the genitive absolute, a genitive noun or pronoun plus a genitive participle, and paraphrastic constructions where a form of ame is combined with a participle and functions like an indicative verb.